and welcome to the Futurum Tech webcast. This show is all things 5G, and it's a new series that we're doing, and we haven't yet hit on the most clever of names. So today, we're going to call it all things 5G, and I am joined today by my fellow analysts, Ron Westfall and Olivier Blanchard, and today we're going to talk about the magic in private 5G networks, and you know, the, the old telco supply chain is... is undergoing a huge process of really digital transformation and of mutating and multiplying and how it's making its way into enterprise premises and the, the things that private 5G is offering up. So it's an exciting time. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, what private 5G networks look like, the value proposition of 5G networks, private 5G networks, who some of the key players are, what some of the innovation that's happening around that. So, you know, with that said, one of the things I want to kick this conversation off with, gentlemen, is I want to talk about, you know, really, let's talk about what, why private 5G. Ron, start us Excellent. Off. Excellent uh, uh, cue. Uh, thank you, Shelley. And yes, I think uh, one uh, term uh, really explains the uptake of private 5G networking, why it's such a hot topic, and that is Industry 4.0. Right. Uh, this is primarily or exclusively a service that's aimed at the enterprise segment, and it entails really the ability for organizations to use a, a plethora of sensors and uh, collaborative robots and other capabilities uh, throughout their facilities, uh, you name it, uh, a smart factory, a smart facility, smart fill in the blank. And this is really, I think, uh, very exciting because what we're seeing now is the successful implementation of uh, private 5G networking. And it's really uh, can be attributed to uh, additional drivers. Uh, for example, uh, regulators have uh, basically pushed a sub six gigahertz spectrum for availability, and that would be suitable for many of these uh, scenarios. And likewise, there's just more availability of unlicensed and shared spectrum that would be supportive of uh, private 5G networking. And uh, a little foregrounding, uh, uh, private networking has been around for a while, and we've had a successful uh, private LTE networks being implemented leading into the now uh, uptake of uh, what is called 5G non-standalone, really the, you know, the combination of 4G and 5G capabilities. And now we're kicking into 5G standalone uh, right. networking uh, for you know, these 5G uh, scenarios. And uh, this is all coming together. And I think one reason why Industry 4.0 is really keen on private 5G networking is that, uh, first of all, it's a security first uh, implementation. Right. Many of these uh, organizations are wary about using public 5G networking to support you know, these smart capabilities. And this is, uh, makes sense. Right. In addition, it's also fundamentally about coverage. That is, when you're talking about operations like mining and seaports and airports and so forth, uh, out offshore drilling facilities, uh, Wi-Fi uh, wi is just a uh, non-applicable, it's just a non-starter. Right. And it's the same reason uh, here as well in terms of security. Uh, 5G just has built-in security capabilities that Wi-Fi, even with the current iterations, really don't deliver quite yet. And, you know, Wi-Fi could be appropriate, you know, for like uh, guest services at a hotel, uh, you know, a visit to the coffee shop, uh, for you know, internal communications at a, a operation center, uh, but it's not going to be able to do the heavy lifting that a private 5G network can do. Yeah. And so this is adding fuel to uh, the uptake. Uh, for example, uh, we've seen um, research from uh, Polaris uh, suggesting that there's 40% compounded annual growth expected in this segment alone uh, through uh, 2028. And as a kicker, you have ABI coming in and saying 60% compound annual growth <laughs> in this segment through 2030. Right. And, uh, you know, we can always um, press on the numbers, but I think it definitely is validating the fact that this is really a space that is hot and is only going to get hotter. And uh, these are many of the reasons why it's just yeah. coming together and generating these headlines that we're talking about today. 
Well, and I think that, you know, when we think about the industries kind of on the forefront of using this, as you touched on them, you know, manufacturing, utilities, um, airports, ports, the mining and the process industry, you know, there's also other applications that maybe some of us have even experienced it and not known about it. For instance, I know that there's been a lot of work in, um, private 5G networks for arenas and sports venues. And, you know, part of that focus is sort of bringing the fan engagement level up. And, you know, we've got a, we've got a fan base these days who are, you know, adept at digital content creation. And many of those enthusiasts have moved beyond the interest in just, you know, taking a photo while they're at an event and uploading it. And they really want to be, you know, shooting video, creating video, doing all different kinds of things. You know, when you think about it, the way we use our devices today is so much different, even than it was five years ago. You know, and in this world, five years is a really long time. So I think that when you're thinking about, you know, the applications for private 5G networks, it really expands beyond um, what you might think, you know. Oh, yes. I mean, there's just a host of possibilities. And this is a, a similar to what we witnessed with LTE when it was first built out. Right. Nobody could predict Uber. You know, we've touched on this before. And the uh, same thing applies to uh, private 5G networking. And there's also work from home scenarios. Uh, there is, you know, any smart uh, facility that includes smart arenas uh, where right. uh, there is a uh, apl application of uh, private 5G networking. And I, I think this is all very exciting. And it's also uh, correlating to, you know, follow the money, you know, or follow the organization chart. You know, we're seeing uh, organizations like or Ericsson and Nokia literally uh, coming out with their own units dedicated exclusively to this. Right. You know, for example, you know, Ericsson, uh, private 5G, uh, and Nokia, you know, private 5G, uh, and so forth. And so, in fact, uh, Nokia actually has what is called uh, digital automation cloud uh, that uh, addresses this uh, very space. And you have, you know, the major telcos, you know, Telefonica, right. AT&T, uh, Vodafone, uh, uh, Verizon, they're all, yeah. you know, looking to capitalize on this. And I think one thing that is very important to understand here and why they're uh, doing this is that, you know, they have expertise in this area. They right. own the spectrum. They know how to optimize uh, MIMO implementations, how to optimize, you know, radio uh, networking and so forth. And so this gives them the opportunity to you know, manage many of these services to you know, work with organizations that aren't going to uh, be keen on doing it all by themselves, so, yeah. so to speak. Absolutely. And so there, there's plenty of opportunity here for the telecos to show off their skills and you know, working with the, you know, their major supplier partners to you know, really uh, you know, make this uh, more of an addressable market right. to take advantage of more opportunities. So yes, uh, th this is, uh, again, a great example of how the ecosystem uh, can come together and make a difference. Yeah. You know, you mentioned uh, Nokia and AT&T. I know they're two of the major players in the space. I came across some examples that I thought were interesting that would be interesting to our audience anyway <clears throat> of this in motion. Um, Edscom and Nokia installed a private network at uh, the Kimi Ring um, Arena in in Finland. It's the largest motorsports and events venue in Northern Europe. And they designed this network to help, as I mentioned earlier, augment media streaming and television broadcast services, but they also want it to help with their testing <clears throat> of autonomous vehicles and connected vehicles, which is really cool. So Edscom, the Finnish company, is partnering with Nokia and using the Edge network and the computing infrastructure to be able to offer this in the stadium, which I think is kind of cool. Um, Another thing that I thought was really fascinating is AT&T has a partnership with um, uh They've built a private 5G network that's being used for the Ellison Institute, which is one of the first medical facilities in the country to use 5G to help advance cancer research. So, okay, so it's really cool to think about, you know, Industry 4.0 and, you know, better fan experiences, but cancer research, like, to me, <laughs> that's really cool. And, you know, what they're doing here is, the doctors 
want to be able to use the network to collect and transmit data from patients to connected devices. So doing a better um, monitoring, a better process of monitoring patients, being able to deliver better care, being able to detect more rapidly, that sort of thing. So I think we're going to see this expand beyond, you know, what our purview is of, you know, in, it's not just industry 4.0, it's so many other things that benefit so many other enterprises and initiatives that benefit from private private 5G networks. And I think that's really why we're expected to see such growth in this market that you just touched on. Excellent examples. Excellent use cases, Shelley. And yes, Nokia has over 300 customers already and is considered the market leader from a you know, supplier perspective in this uh, segment. And Ericsson, for example, acquired CradlePoint uh, last year for $1.1 billion to catalyze you know, their uh, pursuit of this uh, market opportunity. And yes, I, I think we're seeing all kinds of uh, great uh, ecosystem collaboration uh, that uh, further validates your point, Shelley. Uh, for example, we've seen Verizon Business and AWS uh, partner to support Corning and its smart factory implementation. And that is, you know, using those smart sensors and uh, robotics. Uh, so this is, you know, kind of uh, futuristic uh, minor, minority report type scenario is actually uh, becoming real uh, today. Uh, so this is definitely, I think, uh, something that will pick up even more momentum. And I had mentioned uh, that there was a scoop last week, and it's still you know, a, a scoop-like aspect here, and that is NTT is, I believe, the first CSP to offer uh, private 5G networking as a service. Uh, so now it's uh, not just a managed services proposition. You can actually go on to a portal and order up this entire capability uh, through uh, a operator like NTT. Right. And they're using their patent pending micro slicing technology to enable this breakthrough. So we're seeing a pattern here once again in Japan as being you know, the citadel of uh, innovation and breakthrough when it comes to you know, 5G uh, networking, open RAN capabilities, all the moves that Rakuten uh, did at the beginning of August, et cetera. So uh, again, this is just adding fuel to you know, why you know, uh, private 5G is such an attractive uh, offering and why it's different from previous private networking implementations, which were niche, uh, which had you know, a kind of a limited uh, market appeal. But now it's really opening up and broadening because 5G is becoming more mainstream. Everybody's becoming more familiar with its capabilities, taking advantage of the lower latency, higher bandwidth, better security uh, capabilities. And so this is just uh, good news all around. Yeah. And I think that this is also where you're seeing, you know, we've talked a lot about this, but the opportunities that exist for CSPs, communication services providers out there, are they, they abound, right? Opportunities abound. And when we're telling these stories about Edscom, for instance, you know, Edscom wanted to be able to provide this functionality at the motorsports arena, partnered with Nokia. Um, I, I noticed um, AT&T has a partnership with CSP called Extinet, and their focus is also on enhancing connectivity in sports and entertainment venues and on campuses, and they are using fiber and 4G LTE and 5G and private LTE and, you know, all of those things. And you can see this partnership in action, for instance, at the AT&T Stadium in Arlington, Texas. And so it really is being driven in many instances by um, smart communication services providers understanding the the market opportunity here and then partnering with providers to help bring this kind of connectivity. And not that, not that Ericsson and Nokia aren't doing their own fair share of selling these things, but I think this is a huge opportunity for CSPs as well. Yeah, it's a it's a rising tide. Uh, you, know, you have uh, Nokia emphasizing their radio expertise as being a key differentiator, why they can win more deals than some of the other you know, newbies that are coming on and uh, looking to you know, target the space. And I think it's also important to note that it is indeed a end-to-end -end proposition, that it is an ecosystem play. Uh, for example, when it comes to 5G core programmability, uh, you have Ericsson touting that capability and how it's very important for supporting you know, private 5G networking and how, uh, uh, for example, uh, by the uh, use of programmability, you have that flexibility to really do 
what is use case networking. That is using network slices, using uh, the network to be very specific to the needs of that unique customer. And so uh, that, again, I think is just reinforcing uh, your point, Shelley, that this is uh, a great way for the ecosystem to showcase how they are successfully uh, meeting uh, these opportunities. And that is just uh, really uh, uh, going to feel the ability of the operators to win their own business uh, working with these uh, suppliers. Right. And I, I think we understand why uh, that uh, the telcos would have kind of a built-in advantage. And, you know, to be sure, the cloud providers, the hyperscalers, you know, uh, the Azure's, the AWS's, uh, the Google Clouds will work uh, with the operators, as, you know, our examples have already shown. And I, I think they just want to make sure that they have, you know, a play in the game. Uh, for example, uh, Microsoft uh, upped its MEC offering. Uh, that is, uh, every hyperscaler understands that 5G build entails uh, the opportunity to build more edge networking resources. That is, get a as much of these 5G capabilities as close to the 5G activity in order to achieve these low latency capabilities and all the agility and so forth that is required to you know, make this market take off even more. And so, you know, uh, there's just, I think, uh, plenty of pie to go around uh, for all these players to be able to, you know, uh, monetize and uh, simply uh, make uh, more revenues, at least, off of this uh, emerging market opportunity. Absolutely. So I, um, you know, for our viewing audience, I want to make sure that everybody knows that Olivier Blanchard is not here just to be eye candy. His involvement in this conversation is key. <laughs> and, um, what, and I feel like it's impossible to talk about 5G and innovation and what's now and what's next and, and all of the exciting things happening, quite honestly, without bringing Qualcomm into the conversation. And that's really, uh, uh, Olivier spends a lot of time immersed in all things Qualcomm. And I know, Olivier, what the company is doing in San Francisco where it, with its corporate headquarters is all about testing and constantly demonstrating new capabilities and, and all different kinds of things. Talk with us a little bit, if you will, about innovation and, and how Qualcomm is driving that as it relates to 5G. Yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of stuff going on, um, and I'm only going to mention like a tiny, tiny little sliver that, that's relevant to this conversation. I just, I'm just happy that I've gotten to the point now where I can I can listen to Ron <laughs> and understand everything he says. It's such a big deal. Yes. It's such a big deal. It, it wasn't always so. Um, no. And and now I understood everything. And it everything. All made sense, and I'm very happy about that. And you know what's really crazy from my point of view is not only have I been able to understand what Ron is saying, I actually can speak about it and you know know what I'm talking about. And so I feel like personally I've made great strides as well, just as you know, with Ron as my mentor. Yep, yep. I'm I'm in the same boat. Okay, so Qualcomm. Uh, so uh, one thing that that a lot of people don't well, most of what Qualcomm does, <clears throat> people, excuse me, don't necessarily have visibility on because I think we're aware of the Snapdragon mobile platform and all of the Snapdragon related products. We're aware that they have really good modems and that they're very active in R and D for for five G, uh, and they contribute to a lot of the standards and so on and so forth. Um, but something that as uh, as an analyst who's been following them for a while and being pretty immersed in their universe, uh, there, there's something that I've noticed is that they they have these these test beds, essentially these kind of these warehouses where not only do they test new technologies, new techniques new methodologies to optimize 5G networks and, and all of the equipment that goes with it. Um, but they also use them as, as demos. And so uh, they're demos for industry partners. Obviously, Ron has touched on the fact that this is a very rich ecosystem of companies, on, on the one hand, competing against each other, but also all working together um, because there's so many layers to this and so many moving pieces that they all have to kind of, you know, put all the pieces together for their clients, for their customers. 
And in the case of, of private 5G networks, that adds a few more layers of complexity on the front end because you don't just subscribe to a service that a carrier has provided for you. You kind of have to build stuff from scratch. Um, and so these, these demos are always out there and periodically Qualcomm will update the market on what's new. Um, and typically there's an analyst day. There's usually one or two a year where they bring tech journalists, analysts, and some influencers even uh, to their headquarters in San Diego to kind of tour some of these test beds and, and see what's, what's going on and actually see it live. And with, uh, with COVID and travel being restricted for the last year and a half, um, that has moved to kind of a more virtual uh, uh, presentation. And, and I think that some of it gets missed because there's just so much news out there and so much, so much churn. And so many of these companies doing stuff like this now that, that, um, a lot of our audience may have missed, uh, some of what's, uh, what's been happening at Qualcomm and what's coming down the pipe, um, in terms of, uh, private, uh, 5g network, and especially for, uh, industry 4.0 applications. So I'm, I'm currently writing three pieces on this, which we'll publish uh, on our website in the next week or week or so. So look for that. But a couple of points that I wanted to mention so people are aware of them um, is that when we talk about private 5G networks, just like public 5G networks, this isn't a fixed target. Um, the, the technologies, the optimizations, the capabilities are going to keep improving and they're going to keep improving every few months. Uh, and so, for instance, one of the things that, that um, attracted my, my attention when I was doing research on, on these new test beds is that uh, Qualcomm is, is already um, working on optimizing a thing called TSN. Uh, time-sensitive networking. And what that allows industries to do is provide microsecond-level synchronization uh, of all their devices. So imagine that you have uh, a warehouse, a modern warehouse with robots essentially kind of uh, driving things around. Like the sh you don't go to the shelves anymore necessarily. The shelves can come to you. Right. So it could be an Amazon warehouse. It could be any warehouse, any sorting center um, where you're going to have uh, automated uh, uh, guided vehicles. This, this micro uh, um, time-sensitive networking, microsecond level synchronization allows all these things to work better in concert. Um, so that the level of complexity that's, that's required for everything to work together so things don't run into each other, so you don't have problems, is improving. Uh, also, what I'm seeing is uh, a push for side link capacity. So that allows the devices to not only talk to the network, uh, in real time with very low latency, but also talk to each other, which I think is a really important layer yeah. when we're talking about private 5G networks, especially in industry 4.0. Um, and there's also indoor precision positioning, uh, which is also getting super, super good. So you have centimeter level accuracy um, to, uh, to be able to track all of your, uh, your AGVs, your automated guided vehicles in that environment. Mm -hmm. Um, but also something that, that we don't talk about enough, I think, in terms of 5G network optimization is power consumption. So we talk about power consumption on, in the IoT and the IoT in terms of the device itself using low power so that it can run a lot longer uh, on, um, uh, on, on the same charge. But we're also now starting to see 5G networks become optimized for essentially become greener. Um, and so some of the test beds that, that I was uh, researching uh, show new methodologies for end-to-end -end system techniques that can compensate for uh, power amplification issues, uh, especially nonlinear uh, nonlinearity. That's a tough one to, to say for a Frenchie. <laughs> um, so, so essentially, what it does is um, it, it creates new optimizations for networks, and, and especially this is going to be very useful for private networks where every every ounce of power counts, and it's also a huge cost issue uh, when when you're running a plant. Uh, or whether it's the plant itself or the network that you're running through the plant, uh, networks are able to become a lot greener now through these optimizations, through these new power efficiencies. Mm -hmm. So anyway, cool. Qualcomm is working on all this stuff. Uh, they have really interesting things to share. Uh, and so look for three articles on this uh, in the next couple of weeks from me. Absolutely.
we're excited about that. Well, gentlemen, I think our time here has come to an end for our audience. Thank you very much. There's my dog saying it's time to put this show to an end. Um, no, thank you very much for hanging out with us, whether you're watching, whether you're listening. If you're watching the YouTube video, be sure and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss another conversation. If you're listening uh, to the podcast, likewise, hit that subscribe button. We are always happy to have you and appreciate you. Uh, Olivier and Ron, thank you so much for contributing your insights here. Always appreciated. And tune in again next week for all things 5G. 